That was actually it. But we have one more little thing, a copy of last time, event from last time. I'm going to have a look. Let's see if I can find it. Exactly as last time, I'm going to scroll through a couple of pages in the book that takes us through what is called a complete work through examples. It's an example called about car tires, a little toy example again, but still uh, for us to follow what's going on and coming from actually originally some kind of exam uh, exercise. So this is an example with uh, three types of tires, which by the people telling us what it's all about, are called treatments. And then those tire types are being investigated in specifically four different cars that is being named the blocks. Right? So it's tire by cars, two-way table. And each time there is some measurement, which is some kind of fuel economy measurement. What's how to analyze such a data set? Well, as I said, as anyone in elementary school would do, if they were to summarize the story about these data, let's compute the means. Right, and everything this analysis is about is about those means. We have three different means for tire one, two, and three. We have four different means for cars one, two, three, and four. And we have the overall mean being 21.575 kilometers per liter number in this case. We put the data, this is a small, simple data set, we can put it into R. We have a car factor, we have a tire factor, meaning that factor in R means that it tells R that the information about being car 1, 2, 3, 4 is to be interpreted as a categorical or a group information. We're not going to use the exact numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, it's the exact same would come out if I wrote uh, factor uh, minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, minus 4. Any four numbers that are not the same that would code for the four groups of cars could be used. And when I apply the factor function in R, you tell R, consider this as a grouping information. So any kind of coding that codes for the groups in the same way would give the same thing here. So why not use 1, 2, 3, 4? And the same with tires. Then we can plot factors. We've seen that a few times in this class. We like to start with box plots to just give an overview. We should remember by now, I've told you a few times, this is just an illustration of uh, the data. It doesn't really give us the chance to do real statistical analysis based on this. It's just visualization of what's going on to prepare us for what to come and if I had a single extreme observation it might show out here so already I'm prepared for what that might come. Uh, that's a good place to start. I already see well tire one appeared to have the high number, tire two and three appear to be lower, uh, car four appears to be different than cars one, two and three at least apparently it's about like that. So uh, fine I'm uh, getting started. Then, right away, I make the two-way analysis of variance on this little data set by running this code LM Y tilde car plus tire. It's very important that car and tire that are variables in this data set D are being defined as factors. Otherwise, you might just do some kind of meaningless regression analysis, right? If you forgot to specify the factor, if you just put car equal to the numbers 1 to 4, the analysis that you do 
is exactly, I mean, the code is exactly as a re regression analysis, and R would not give you a warning or anything. It would just do a regression analysis on the numbers one, two, three, four, which is completely meaningless in this case. It's just a grouping, it's just a coding of the cars. So the safe uh, advice when you store information, of course, would be to tell people, whenever you have a categorical information, maybe use some characters instead. Call them car A, B, C, D, then you would never make this mistake. So that's uh, one thing you could tell people. What I usually do when I check my analysis of variance outputs, because it's an easy mistake to make when you read data and you maybe have an Excel sheet with a lot of columns, then you may remember to put one of them at a factor, but then you forget that oh, I'm going to use this column 18 instead in my analysis, and then you forgot to define column 18 as a factor. And so it's a very easy practical mistake to make when you start, when you're in the middle of what we don't teach you very much about in this cl class, the whole data mingling thing, which is part of most data science stats work, uh, which you will be taught other places that in our class here. Nevertheless, I check right away the DF column. If I have a DF of one, ah, I go check, maybe I did a mistake. Either it's because the grouping factor only has two levels, then it's fine, then it should be one, or it's because I forgot to define it as a factor. So if I know it's not only two groups, I go check. That's just a practical thing. Then we get the results with the conclusion about what's going on. Here's the R version, and then below we see the LaTeX PDF version of the same information. What is the conclusion when it comes to whether cars, respectively tires, car types, tire types, are different on their mean values of fuel economy, which is what we're studying here? What's the conclusion? Are the four cars different when it comes to fuel economy, mean fuel economy? Yes, they are. Are the four, the three tire types different when it comes to fuel economy, averagely? Yes, they are. ka -ching, you had one question in 30 seconds if you're on top of this. You might get a question like that. You will see if you take the old exams. Somehow, sometimes there is a question like this. Hey, what's the conclusion based on this output? If you're on top of this, now you listened in, you're all on top of this, you guys are here, or you guys who listen in out there, then you have a... Uh, friendly one there. You gave, I gave you one point up there and it took you one minute. On average, you have eight minutes at each question. You have 30 questions, four hours, eight minutes each. Don't stress. Such a one here would be, would be a present, right? If you're on top of it. Question. Why is the significance level 2.5? It is not. Oh, uh, why it isn't? You're uh, referring to this m uh, multiplicity thinking. That's a very good question indeed. I would be inclined to uh, follow your idea there, actually. Good idea. But no one does it. <laughs> You're right. Uh, I think people would argue these are two completely different independent things, and in such a uh, setting, you might not need to do it. But this is something you can always get a discussion about, because what is your meter level of protection here? Uh, that discussion could go on forever. So yes, a very good point, but let's not talk too much about it, because we're not going to use it. We use 5% on those in two individual tests in such a table. But you have a point. Thanks. Good. Before we get too carried away, we should, as always, check whether our assumptions, now I did the conclusions maybe a bit rapidly, I didn't check the assumptions yet, 
Uh, so I should check the assumptions. That looks nice. Don't even want to bother about Wally here. Um, what about what about variance homogeneity, which is this assumption, non-trivial assumption about the sigma being the same all over? We don't do that by hypothesis testing or any way. We do it by this visual check. It looks fine. If you were a bit critical, <laughs> you might add, what was, what's your uh, question? There's a big difference, you say? Well defined big. That's <laughs> big, okay. <laughs> yes, in a way you're, I mean, I d again, I don't disagree too much. Uh, yes, it could potentially be a big difference here. Yes. Knowing how many observations we have in this silly little data set, <laughs> I'm not worried. But of course, we are doing statistics in a, in a, toy, in a toy case here, right? Um, if I had a thousand data points and I had this difference, I agree with you, uh, that would probably be something to think about. Yeah. Then we have other methods of investigating this, but we don't teach you those in this course. We also have methods to deal with that, of course. But again, that's next step. It's not a rocket science, but hey, we only have 13 weeks and five points to, to work with here. So good question again. Post hoc, there are many, diff there are also a lot of some inbuilt f nice functions in R. I mean, go Google and find them. Uh, there are so many options. But I show you the very basics here of what you could do for the post hoc. I mean, the very basic you could do is simply to compute the means. Again, they were already in the table. So I, I mean, I could just go find them in the table. But here I find them in, in R, the three tire means. The, yeah, now I focus on the tires for that's, that's the, the treatment. Then we should or could do the pairwise comparisons. How many can we do when there are three? Three times two divided by two, that's three, actually. One, two, one, three, two, three. That could be counted also without any formulas. I show you here then how an approach that can be used generally. And I, <laughs> I also have a different. Uh, no, I, it's actually OK, because this should uh, now I thought it was a mistake. It's not a mistake, because it should actually be 1 minus alpha half, right? And now because of the 3, it becomes 1 minus alpha divided by 6. So that's how it. Uh, it it becomes actually still right. I use, I correct with three, capital M equal three in a Bonferroni correction. That's what I do here. It should be one minus alpha half. If I not don't do a correction, then it becomes one minus alpha sixth because I have the factor three in there to do the Bonferroni correction. I use the right degrees of freedom, I hope. Let's go check. I use six degrees of freedom, of course, ridiculously small data set, um, but it's a toy data set. That's the degrees of freedom there. And then I use the formula for, once again, how is degrees of freedom computed? In the two way and over, it's L minus one times K minus one. K and L is 3 and 4, right? So it's 2 times 3, making the number 6. Are we OK on that? One more question? The question is about Bonferroni and, and, and uh, um, let me see how I, I did say this. I'll see how should I say it again in a different way. If I did not use the Bonferroni, I would, to find the non-directional critical value to do either hypothesis test or a confidence band, I would use 
one minus alpha half when I do a five when I do an alpha when I do a five percent test I use two and a half percent I use ninety seven point five that's why I have the extra factor two then when I correct with the Bonferroni I say I do a five percent over three version test and I do that by dividing by two once again to get alpha half in the individual tests. I d uh, don't make sense to what you say, so I think we should have a discussion about this after afterwards, actually. Yeah. What I was giving you an example of is this. I mentioned it last time. When the Ni and Nj are the same all over, that's what we discussed last time in one way and over, and in the two way and over, they are the same, then all the pairwise confidence intervals between any means here would have the same width. And we can compute that width once and for all by this formula. Here in our version, it's actually square root two times MSE. Should we see if we could find the formula? I think we have the minute to do that. Now that I'm having it here. Here we are. Back in there one way, so we'd need to adapt it, but it's the same formula. We take the t quantile, we take square root 2 times MSE divided by m, where m is this uh, equal number of observations in each of the groups that we compare. If I apply this, and then I should see if I can get back. That's the formula I've used here over m, where in this case I have four cars for each tire. That's the that's the M here, right? This is the formula to be used, and then I times the T quantile, right? The T quantile is there also, T. That gives a joint value, least significant difference value. It's basically the width of all of those confidence intervals that we can uh, find here. But with this uh, way of using it, such that I find the number 2.5 three six kilometers per liter. This is how different two tire types should be to be called statistically significantly different. W with the Bonferroni correction thing, now I'm doing comparing everything. So I take the number 2.53 and I compare with the basic, basically I could boil everything down to this little thing, right? I started out with my data. Here, I'm interested in tire types. That's the purpose here. I'm doing a, a study for some of the tire producers. I compare three means of tire types. I can clearly see which is better than the other, right? The question is, are these statistically different? Or the, are the differences that I see here just a matter of... Uh, Pure random noise. Did we get the same means there? Whoa, we have a discrepancy. I'll have to go back and check. Because these means are not the same three means as I gave you on this table, which of course doesn't make sense. 20.925. Tire 3, 21, maybe as just, it's maybe it's just, if, if the last thing is right, I think it is, this should be 23 actually. That can be easily checked. I think that's correct because the other one comes from the R. So it's a typo in this table, I'm sure. 
Anyway, that's not the, the point here. The point, the point is, I take the three means, and then after all my computations, I found this key number, 2.5. Tire types need to have a difference, based on these data, of more than 2.53 kilometers per liter to be that we know that they're different, that we know there is a different signal. Otherwise, we have not really proved them uh, any d d different, right? So that's all, in a way, the two-way and over put into maybe the core number that distinguishes signal from noise. So what are the signals? The signals are the means, but are they really different? How different should they be to be a real signal? That's important for decisions in company, in business, in science, society, that we make the decisions on with the information about how uncertain things really is, are. I take this measuring stick, I compare these two, they are the same. I compare two and one, they are the same. I compare one and three, they are not the same because they have a difference of more than 2.536 and you can depict it by this compact letter display or any other way you like to show it. That was once again, you can see it was the same approach, same way of looking at it that and as we did last time. Now we just have the two-way setting. I could summarize the car issues the same way if I wanted, but that's not included here. Isn't the difference exactly? Okay, good. So I didn't have to relate to that question. Nothing better than things fixing themselves. That's the best in life. Anyway, that's it. Ah, we need to declare a winner. I thought I could just go away. We need to find the winner of today. Pick a true statement. Last question. At least for the guys and gals hanging in, it's not too bad. Um, the two, the blue and the green, are not right because the blue and the green express that they appear, appear to be the same, either the assessors or the means, and the p-values are clearly very small. So the means are clearly different. Now, I put in, didn't put those options in. I put some other true options in, namely those focusing on which F distributions are really used by R to produce those p-values. That's part of the theory and the method I've given you. And both of them were correct in that it's an F distribution to, to test the TVs. It's an F distribution with 11 for the Numerator and 77, the error degrees of freedom for the denominator. So 11,77 F version for the one test. And it's the 7.77 for the other test. And these were the two red and yellow options. So they were both okay. Should we see? So let's start with number three. The number person, good job. <laughs> and uh, rest in peace, Thürach, good job there. <laughs> and then finally, the winner, expert, great. <laughs> you don't get rich to win these competitions, but you get the honor, so uh, good job. Uh, see you next week, and enjoy whatever comes.